Yeah, I was just saying, Robbie, uh, we're, we're live now. I was just saying that I want to, all, all the stuff you were saying just before, I want to get it live because I feel like those those kind of catch-up conversations are always the best ones and I never press record early enough, so I wanted to change that. So, Robbie, Burke, uh, if I if I may say, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on the podcast, my friend. <laughs> God, I don't know about that. I don't know about it, an honor. It, it truly is. It truly is. Uh, for the... My, for my, my family would disagree with that anytime I walk through them. An honor for this guy. Get out of here. <laughs> for for the three people that don't know who you are, uh, can you tell us a little about you, uh, a bit, a little bit about yourself, Robbie? Yeah, absolutely. So, I am a human being from the universe. My postal code is Earth. Um, so, <laughs> I believe we're all in this together. Very much a universalist man. Don't believe in any of these made up divisions. I couldn't care less if you're white black gay straight whatever spiritual context you like to follow i'm just all about being a good person full of love unconditional so that kind of sets an early stage but give, give you a little more background i'm from dublin ireland live in ireland uh currently as well um got into strength and conditioning when i was about 19 met my first mentor martina mccarty i worked at dublin city university was fortunate enough to meet her martina was actually a previous athlete for Ireland in the 2000s um, Sydney Games 4x400 and met her. She opened up my whole world into strength and conditioning. I got fascinated with it. She was the person who introduced me to Mike Boyle, my next mentor. Interned at Boyle's in 2009 when I was 22. Met my third mentor there who was really, like I didn't work directly under Mike. I worked directly under Nicole Rodriguez. She was my mentor during my internship. One of the greatest tech technicians I've ever seen in my life in terms of coaching. She's phenomenal. Um, just an amazing coach in terms of her control of a group, her ability to communicate. She went on to work for Exos. I know she's out on her own mm -hmm. over in Poland now. Um, phenomenal coach. Came back then from that internship in January 2010. And I just basically had been doing... Um, You know, people call it strength and conditioning, physical preparation. I suppose athletic development now is kind of the third title it's gone on to now. And it probably is the best one out of the lot because it's a little more descriptive of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, done that mainly within Gaelic Games, which is the National Games of Ireland here, which incorporate hurling and Gaelic football. There's also the women's version, which is Camogie, which is essentially just the name for female hurling, but it's a separate organization to the GA. It's a bit messed up. And then ladies Gaelic football, which is a third separate organization, but they're the same sports. So just that the ladies have two separate organizations for their football and hurling. And the men have just got the GAA, but they're traditional Irish sports, chaotic field game sports, phenomenal games, very skillful. And that's kind of, they're the athletes I've mainly trained up until 2017. I kind of took a break then from coaching, got a little bit burnt out finished on just folks in my master's as I did through St. Mary's and Twickenham. And currently right now, I'm actually just gone back into coaching and I'm just really coaching kids at the moment. So I've kind of gotten more into the long-term athletic development model and realizing that, you know, instead of trying to take adaptive athletes to take a term from Paul Kilgallen, he calls, you know, adults are already ad adapted and it's kind of hard to get them back to being adaptive. Right. Kind of let's start going back. Let's let's start going back to the root source. You know, get them when early and fresh and young, when they're five, six, seven, and then obviously in those critical teenage years, the bridge between childhood and, and adulthood, and you know, and obviously, really, what we're doing for me anyway with the sport is we're just instilling life values, and sport is just a medium. You know, so for me, I'm still kind of just getting back into this, but my vision going forward is to what I would really love to do, Sean, is to take a good group of under 14 players be that boys or girls i could probably relate more to boys because i've been a boy since i was born so i'm probably a little more easy to relate to as well for for males and females but i've no problem working with males i love working with females as well but my my sort of aspiration right now would be to take a group of under 14 take them for four years until they're 18 kind of you know be that mentor for four years and educate them on things like you know circadian rhythms and sleep and breath work and hydration and and um Um, nutrition and, and movement and you know human behavior and obviously then doing that through the medium of teaching them like the principles of sport you know technical and tactical so you know using those five pillars the uh, physical the technical the tactical the psychological and the lifestyle kind of taking them on a four-year journey and trying to be a mentor and see if if my sort of i wouldn't call it an intervention but see if i can do something positive Because I know if I was 14 and I had that, I think I would have embraced it. So, yeah, I'm getting more back towards youth coaching 
and it's funny because a lot of like say Nicole that's where she's gone back to too because I think it's just as you said it's like um you know it's like again when they're adults there's there's like damage is a bit of a, a harsh word to use but there is a, a lot of damage already done by that stage when they're in their mid-20s even 30s and it's kind of like you know we need to start stripping this back to as soon as we can get them so that's why I've gone back to the five-year-olds and seven-year-olds and sort of have this vision of working with teenagers now in the next yeah, 12 to 18 months when a, when a position opens up again to take over an under 14 squad um so that's a bit yeah that, that's a bit about my background and kind of as I jokingly sort of said at the start we're kind of half joking but serious I'm a universalist at heart I believe nothing lives in isolation everything's connected I always joked that strength and condition was like it was the first door I walked in and it was the door that opened me up to all these other doors so when I went into the strength conditioning door, it's like, oh, there's this nutrition one over here. And then there's this functional medicine one. And there's this rehab one. And then there's this human behavior and psychology one. And so you just keep going up, down up, you know, into these holes or rabbit holes, all these doors. And I always joke that it was like one day I just like, I just like woke up like in a pool of my sweat on the ground face down. And I got back up and I was like, oh, and I just kind of like turned around and like looked. And it was like, you know, that, that music that like, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. and I was like oh my god and it's just like I'm looking at the universe it's just a bit and I'm like it's all connected I need to know everything <laughs> so kind of like you I'm a generalist and I'm a, a lifelong learner and I'm, I'm always trying to connect dots in 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 also the mindset that I'll never know it all and I and I always know enough to know that I don't know uh very much um i think we all go through the stages in our lives where we're like you know we're dangerous we think we have a little bit of knowledge we know everything usually around that early 20s stage and you're you're aggressive and you tell people what they should do you should eat paleo because i read this and i know more than you and you know fucking you know like uh heavy barbell back squatting's dumb and you should just do single leg work and uh, i'm being a bit facetious here but don't people don't take that off and you know don't run with that i'm just being a bit jokey here but you know when you're young you think you know everything and you're trying to save people in the world and then, you know as as I, as I matured anyway and maybe learned a bit more buddhism you're like you know the only thing you can really do is just live your own truth and the only thing you can actually really do is influence what you create moment to moment so really it just comes down to your internal environment like look after that first and just live that as best and as best as you possibly can and as true as you possibly can and whatever energy then just comes from you and emits out that's all you can control so it really just comes down to you how you can regulate your physiology how you can regulate your perception of reality how you really want to carry yourself so it's just like if we just focus more inward and then just didn't worry about any external stuff which is always way easier said than done i understand that that's all part of the human experience too is to is to try and sort of you know feel those emotions but be able to sort of ride those waves but uh yeah universalist snc got me into this hole and uh I just love human humans, human behavior, human experience, and everything that goes with the whole life journey. So, uh, and I've, as you can tell, I like to ramble. So, that's another that's, thing. It's good. You, you, you also. Uh, the way I know I knew you is uh, through your podcast. Uh, all, all things strength and wellness. Uh, terrible, terrible title. Yeah, definitely terrible title and terrible podcast. <laughs> I would not advise anybody go and listen to your episodes. I, I, I'm I'm proud to say that there was a time where I was up to date with all your episodes because I I'd found you. I don't know what number you were on, but I'd gone back and listened to all of them. Um, I've I've fallen off the bandwagon uh, for a bit, so I'm I'm not fully up to date. But I always appreciated your uh, your your curiosity. You you have very uh, a very interesting. I guess you're just you're just an, you're just a curious guy, and like you said, there's so many doors to go through to open and to explore, and and then one moment you're on this topic, so your questions are kind of you know biased towards it, which which makes total sense. And I mean, I find I find myself very much in what you say as a as a generalist, as someone who just likes to investigate stuff, and and I really using the podcast as my medium to to ask the questions to the people that that probably know a bit more than that, that definitely know a lot more than me and that can maybe point me or help me to get to that next door. Right. And, and know what direction to take with what I'm thinking. And am I going in the right direction? Do I need to reorient? Um, is that something that you still do today with your podcast? Absolutely. And it's the exact reason that I started my podcast too. Like I always have the joke of why I started. And I was like, I asked Paul check for a consultation. It was $500. And then when I said, podcast it was free and i was like oh i think i just stumbled on some <laughs> magic here it's you know I, mean? I, I say that all the time like my podcast is my continuing education and it's 
it's it's really crazy like you said it's absolutely crazy the 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 people that we're able to reach and connect with and uh, obviously then you have to do a good job of it you can't just you know do 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 garbage and then expect for you to your thing to last but it's such uh, an accessible way of actually talking to whoever you want to talk within reason, or at least if you're patient, you can pr- pr- probably talk to anybody that you want. Right. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, to be honest, too, it, 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 it helps me keep in touch with people too. Like me and mm-hmm. you, this is the first time we've actually ever t- spoke face to face. I know it's virtual here, but we've connected through messaging before. So even for things like this, I think it's great too. You know, like, um, yeah, I just just to stay in touch with people too. Like obviously you can do that behind scenes, but I, I always just think that like you probably notice too. There's, there's probably phone calls you have with people in the conversations on reading like, damn, that really should be recorded and people should hear that because it was amazing. Like you know, if I record every single conversation I've had with like Pat Davidson or like Evan Pike and myself and Evan would 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 call each other. I'd say we we probably have fairly in depth conversations once every two to three months. It depends. You know, I'm I'm me too. I'm always. I always, I was trying to say this to Pat Davidson as well. I was like, I'm just a bit like respectful of their time too as well, you know. And he's always like, man, man just fucking. Like, I'll talk to you all the time, and like so. But yeah, it's just as well. It's just some of the conversations with some of those people are just like, I think it's a crime that this isn't being recorded and people aren't hearing it. So for me, it's that too. But yeah, it was definitely just a network and to meet people and like the amount of good that has come from the podcast in terms of just relationships. And you you know yourself like getting those messages like every now and again like I, I really love your podcast i love the work you've done or you open my eyes to this and i just want to say thanks and that stuff really does pick you up because there's been loads of times where like you know you could just be kind of feel like you're kind of stagnant or wandering or just having one of those days where you know everything's just a bit like meh and then you get a message like that and you're like you know what life's pretty good it's nice to get it's nice to get messages like that you know so yeah but for me it was just networking and, and to meet people and like right now, like we 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 would know each other if you know I didn't put out that crappy title podcast. So, <laughs> that, no, that's right. And and we're, we're like aggregators, right? We're trying to connect dots. And for me, that's where the magic always happens: is between two ideas or two topics, or or, or yeah. two two people's view of the world and how they intersect and what gets created in that in that middle. And for this it's so vast and there's so many people that go super deep into stuff and God knows it's, it's important to have specialists, but then would you say that we're currently miss lacking generalists uh, in, in the sense of connecting all those dots together? I feel like there's a, there's a disconnect between how deep we've gone into some topics and then how little we can connect it to adjacent things or even things that are, you know, far removed, but still linked in some way or another. Yeah. Like, I can't say that that's what I'm currently seeing just in my current environment now, but I, I could definitely see how that could be the case. Like I, I suppose one thing just, just due to the um, the vast connectedness we have now with social media and internet, like one thing that I do see is uh, there's just seems to be a lot of people now, it's probably just in our circles, like there are a lot of people in our circles are doing PhDs and they're really studying like these isolated topics so in-depthly. And I suppose, you know, the question I was going back to like, how useful is that like in terms of applicability because i'm definitely probably one of the most guiltiest is guilty even a word but i'm very guilty of this is that like i i'm very much a knower and i probably don't do enough and that's probably why i've gotten back into coaching with kids and stuff i want to get more back into the trenches again because like i love to learn but like people who are close to me are like robbie loves to learn but he could do it applying a bit of it and just like I, I, Google Will Hunting just describes me. That's exactly what I'm. I'm Will. Like you know, I'm there, and it's when like Rob Williams calls him out and says, "Listen, you could like, re- like you know, know everything about like all the knowledge, but it's like you know, you haven't felt your best friend's head in his hands when it got blown up in a war, or do you know what I mean, stuff like that." And I'm like, yeah. So for me, I I need to be just a little more of the doing than the knowing, you know, because I could stay reading and and hypothesizing and philosophizing all the time. But getting back to your question about specialists and generalists. I haven't really seen that in my own circle, but I could see how that can be the case. Like one thing that does come into my mind, Sean, and that, that has come in over the years uh, as I've learned more and grown more, just a thought that comes in is like, you know, th- th- there are people who are so well-versed in one particular topic, but so illiterate in other areas. And that's why I, I always find the word genius or expert a bit, eh, I don't know what to make of those words because Einstein, 
obviously a genius when it came to physics and quantum mechanics and that whole realm. But did he know anything about sleep and circadian rhythms and hydration and movement and nutrition? And then, like, I'm not saying that he even needed to know that. The next question would be, well, did he need to know that? And then another interesting question is, do we need to be so fundamentally, like, I don't want to say flawed, but have such gaps in one area of our life that we can put our energy into this other area where, like, that was just our purpose in life. We were meant to be so good at that one thing that we just had to be so redundant in other areas. So, and it does fascinate me to a degree where some people are so well versed in one area, but yet so blind to some basic things. Like again, you get these amazing doctors in certain specialties with cancer, and but then you look at their lives, and it's just like again, no concepts of sleep and circadian rhythm and nutrition, and they're just so unhealthy. And it's just like you know, it's just it's almost as if like do you not see like the irony in that like you're getting these patients riddled with this disease because of these like simple factors like sunlight and, and water and and that's kind of where it goes back to the generalists like where I, I i to me like it's like i see i always see it nearly as training it's like i think we all need this just this general foundation and then we build specificity on top of that and then we you know we have a peak of whatever it is so you can nearly say like it's like if you're just like look at life it's just like there's just this general knowledge, which is kind of what we get at school. And then we specialize. And then like we have this peak of where like, that's our meaning. We were meant to, you know, musician, poetry, chef, coach. And then that can also change you. Like you don't have to stick to this one thing, but in, like, for 10 years of your life, music might've just given your soul that purpose. And then towards the end, like that doesn't fulfill me anymore. It's like, I think I'll do the chef thing for a while or, you know, I'll open a cafe or, you know, it's like, we're always just fine all we want as humans is meaning and purpose. That's what we want. We're looking for meaning and purpose. The meaning of life is to find meaning. And how we do that is how we individualize. But I think a good way to think about that is to be a generous at first. And I think if you do specialize, you can just go down into, you know, if you specialize too early, too soon. And it's, it's funny, isn't it? Like, it sounds like if you just took that as a soundbite, it would just sound like we're talking about coaching here again, like long-term athletes. But it's like, you know, early specialization, not good. Broad base of general skills. Sounds good. I think it's the same too when it comes to knowledge, you know, just general, you know, get a good general basis stuff. And again, it's just that I think in school too, I don't know what it's like over where you are. It's probably most places in the world. Cause I'm also about solutions rather than just, you know, complaining. So like if someone says, well, what would you do in school? Well, I really think what would benefit kids is some type of education on human behavior, some education on circadian rhythms, some education on sleep hygiene, on hydration and good food and there's some people could talk about we could get into like dogma wars here and then just movement praxis like stuff that we know but just isn't applied like and you so, know, stuff that's going to serve us our whole life and that we're going to be dependent yeah. on or, or that it, things that are factors that are going to have the biggest impact on the quality of our life and you talked about you know fulfillment and 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 also you know the the, the social nature of the the, the human animal it's how about we learn how to live together and we learn you know all those important things um you two things one i didn't want to forget it's an, it's interesting you mentioned uh uh too much of a learner and enough of a, of a doer I, I heard a quote on a video recently a guy called dan on youtube that i started following really interesting um videos and content around um you know what it is to be an entrepreneur like a solopreneur in in 2022 yeah. and and the digital world and what it opens for as possibilities. And one thing that he said was don't let knowledge acquisition outpace execution. And yeah, that's that a great was, way of putting it. That was quite, that was quite eloquently put. The second thing I wanted to come back on, because you've mentioned it now uh, enough times for me to notice in the podcast is circadian rhythms. I've been, uh, found a video the other day and uh, I haven't really delved deep into that topic. Not as much as my wife has, um, but I found this fascinating uh, video talking about uh, essentially, yeah, sunlight, uh, as simple as that. And then talking about melatonin production, uh, mitochondria, you know, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, uh, infrared light, and the pineal mm -hmm. gland mm -hmm. at night. Um, talk, talk to us about the circadian rhythm. Where do you see, uh, let's start, start as a big picture thing. And then let's, let's try to zoom in on a few things that you've been really interested in recently. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because I've been three areas I sort of penciled down into my journal of areas I wanted to focus on was human biomechanics and movement. So I went through like PRI and Bill Hartman's model sort of this year. And then the other thing was tactical periodization. And then the third thing was light. So I was like, I really want to get more educated on light. 
Um, so with regards to, to um, circadian biology or circadian rhythms anyway, first of all, I was like, I've never really come across a good definition of circadian rhythm. You know, a few times you say to me, what is circadian rhythm? Like, cause kind of what comes to your head is a circadian rhythm, like dark cycles. But so I actually went and tried to look and look up definitions of it or what sort of organizations say, like what was out there. And essentially it's, it's one of, it's, it's essentially a biological rhythm. So we have a circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm, circadian meaning round and, and day in or dying and meaning day so it's like it essentially relates to the 24-hour cycle of the planet and so we have it's one of many biological cycles so circadian rhythm is one then there's a diurnal cycle which is just light and dark then we also have say the menstrual cycle is seen as a cycle within itself which is monthly and then we have obviously uh seasonal cycles so from each season 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 so circadian uh or so bio, bio, biological cycles can go from a micro to a macro and circadian is just one of those and the circadian cycle is just revolves around a 24 hour period of a day and it essentially is the the definition that i saw was it is the physiological physical mental and behavioral changes that occur in the in the human body and any living organism within a 24 hour period and it's regulated by a master clock in the in your hypothalamus which is the part of your brain so there's a nucleus. A nucleus is a group of neurons in the central nervous system, just for extra bonus points. When it's in your, if you have a group of neurons in your peripheral nervous system, it's called a ganglia. Uh, but so you have a nucleus in your hypothalamus called your suprachiasmic nucleus, and that's the master clock of your body. It basically just regulates like when hormones should be released, hunger signals, when you know certain enzymes of your digestive tract are released, what time of day they most peak, uh, neurotransmitter releases. And um, so it regulates all these processes in your body throughout the day and they fluctuate and oscillate over 24 hour cycles. And in terms of the biggest environmental, external environmental factor that can influence that master clock in your head, it's light. So like sunrise and sunset and light cycles matched in with dark cycles. And that's the biggest external factor that can entrain or synchronize your, your master clock. And that's why things like jet lag happen because we're just so out of sync to our, our natural circadian rhythm for where we are. That takes us usually some time to catch up on. Now, there, the, the research is shown in circadian rhythms. So you have, that's your, pri your primary master clock is in your, is in your hypothalamus. That's your suprachiasmic nucleus. But there's these peripheral clocks in every single tissue then throughout your body, skeletal tissue, organs like your liver and stuff, digestive tract. And there are, actually regulated by things like meal timing and exercise and some people have even hypothesized social interaction and, and um even has a an impact on regulating the peripheral clocks mm. with so like so for instance like the peripheral clocks in your liver and pancreas of like what time of day like should they often be rele releasing like their enzymes and you know on all the functions that the liver does and whatnot so essentially you have this circadian rhythm and master clocks master clock in your in your hypothalamus your scm Superchiasmic nucleus, peripheral clocks in your tissues, but just again, it's the big takeaway is that the biggest sort of environmental factor in that whole system is light, the regulation of light. And so now we get to the conversation of well, man-made light or artificial light, and it's everywhere. And light is everything. This is what I've only realized lately in terms of my research into light. So we have what's called the electric magnetic spectrum, which has non-visible light and visible light. And the non-visible light are things like gamma waves and X-rays, which are before ultraviolet. They're underneath ultraviolet light. And then at the other end of that spectrum, after infrared or after red light, we have infrared light, we have microwaves, we've got radio waves, and they're all light. So right now, me and you're using Wi-Fi. That's light. And light is just information. So light brings things into formation, in formation. So everything is light. And if you even look at, at biology, biology is underpinned by chemistry, but in chemistry is underpinned by physics. And in physics, within physics is the field of studying biophotons and light. So if you keep breaking your proteins and carbs and fats down into their anatomical, or their atomic, not anatomical, atomic structures. So you have, your pro, you have your proton and nucleus in the center and you have your electrons on the outside and you break that down even further, you're like, well, what moves that stuff around? It's like light particles, light wave lights. So when people say, when you get those like real spiritual airy fairy people going, we're just light, we're energy and light. And then you get like conventional people going, you're fucking quack, you're crazy. It's like, actually they're right, even though they are weirdos, but they are right. It actually is just all light when you break it down. Because when you actually talk like to the actual proper ass physicists who study this stuff, 
they speak about it as if like it's so like oh yeah we all know that you know if you know it's just like it's the sun you know the photons come from the sun and, and then but like we know this already like most normal people actually do notice if you just go to um high school science photosynthesis remember that and they're like yeah yeah, I remember that. I didn't really like it, but I remember the photosynthesis thing, you know, the light with the plants and they take and turn the energy. Yeah, how about that? So, like, it's just all light, man. But, uh, so the light, basically on that electric magnetic spectrum, we have the visible light spectrum. And to, uh, the way I explain it to people is you've seen a rainbow, and they're like, yeah, I've seen a rainbow. It's like, that's the visible light spectrum there. Those colors that you see, everything that goes from the violet to blue to indigo to the cyan green yellow orange redness you see different books and they, they'll present different colors within that but mainly it's just those rainbow colors mm. and when they when they when they come together as one they give what's called white light and, and that's that event that essentially gives us the ability to see all around us like everything we see right now so if something seems blue it's because the blue wavelengths are what are, are most strongly being reflected back into our retina into our eye same then if it's red or green it's just those wavelengths have been reflected back into the, the retina and then the amazing fucking, the whole amazing creation that is vision. Like when you study like the eyes and vision, it's fucking, you're just like this, like how is that even possible? I, I'm always amazed like how someone even just understood it the first time I was like, so like, you know, even like with, with even like with vision formation, Sean, it's like, like the images actually go into our eye upside down and then they get recorrected in the visual cortex back in there back in the back of our skull in the visual cortex it's just, it's nuts like so images actually come upside down and back to front and they just reconfigurate so everything looks it's just it's nuts and that's only vision so also with our vision too we have we have our we have our vision so our eyes vision to see things but then our eyes also take light in as information and that's that's what regards back to the suprachiasmic nucleus that's called the non-optic visual pathway that regulates physiology in our body and and that, that could get into the whole thing with like sort of you know, conventional medicine is more so into like vi vision formation. Uh, uh, you know, it's all about like refraction and accommodation and pupil constriction to, to help us with vision. But when you start getting into circadian rhythms and sleep and light, it's more like we're talking more about that non optic visual pathway, the one that actually hits the suprachiasmic nucleus to, to, to regulate the mass, to regulate the master clock and then to regulate all the physiological processes in our body. That one's not a study as much in medicine. And that gets into that sort of weird area with sunglasses and all this because sunglasses can actually be very very detrimental because what's essentially happened is because we live in chronic indoor we're chronically indoor creatures now our eyes are becoming so deconditioned to full spectrum light that when mm -hmm. people actually go out they actually their eyes are so deconditioned to just like normal daylight levels that they have to and wear these sunglasses yeah and, and that's probably the same with the skin right uh, one oh, absolutely thing my, one thing my it's wife did in the in the spring and the summer and she was really um uh, disciplined about it is every morning she spent time on the balcony uh and spent time in the sun uh especially before it got super hot which meant that you know when she did go into it it's almost like that hor hormetic uh hormetic dose right and which means that in the summer she didn't get a single sunburn because, absolutely because she had built up her tolerance to uh to to light and to everything that comes from the sun uh, in small doses early in the morning when it's the best time to do it. Um, now it's the winter, the, the sun rises later and there's a lot of clouds. One thing I've been doing and it's really helped me one, go to sleep uh, and then two, wake up and, and feel like I'm ready to go uh, at night. And that's um, mostly thanks to, to Lynn, my wife, um, turn lights off in the evening and we have yeah. those little camping lights and they have a red mode. So we walk around oh, with great. a couple red red lights which is super nice because it's it's really calming you don't realize it but then when you you do it a couple times and then you turn a bright light on again and it's 9 p.m you're like uh no uh so that's one thing we've done and i'm i'm out like a <laughs> like a light no pun intended, <laughs> no pun intended by by like 9 15 i'm out and every morning for the last week because i had some trouble sleeping before that lots of work stress whatnot but i've been getting back into a good rhythm again circadian rhythm uh, with that and every morning at five I'm up without an alarm clock and I get Beautiful. on the bike and I cycle for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes and I, I haven't used it enough but I have this infrared lamp that I got a little while ago and so I just put it on right in front of me so I'm, I'm essentially just getting that in while I cycle and when it feels great I feel I don't I do drink coffee because I enjoy it but I don't need coffee to feel awake and that's been really interesting because I literally just wake up every morning at five without a, an mm. alarm clock and I feel good and I do my thing. 
And then it ties back to the evening where we took the lights down and, uh, or at least reduced the amount of, you know, intense bright lights. And, and that has a huge effect on, on my sleep. What, what, uh, one, what do you think of this Two, How can I do it better? No, it, listen, it's, it sounds like you're doing great. And, and I will admit that the next area I need to explore more on, and, and there are people who are well more um, versed on the topic of actual light therapies and when to use light than I am. It's, it's an area that actually I, I'm not that educated on. Like, so, you know, because I've seen some people, you know, talk about, well, when is the best time to dose red light? And, you know, you know, is it morning? Is it nighttime? You know, certain things like that. One thing I have learned is from what i've read just recently it's 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 very important that we're getting like the right amount of different wavelengths like so every every mm. wavelength on the electric magnetic spectrum is important within certain dosages and ratios in regards to all the different wavelengths right. within within the electric magnetic spectrum so uh, i'm just reading a book now i'm almost finished called light therapies it's a phenomenal book. Um, Martel is the is the author. M M A R T E L. I think it's uh, uh, his first name. I'll have to look up again. But he is he's he was one of the original founders of the International Light Association, and the book essentially just go. It's basically like the, you know what is light and the history of light medicine and sort of the sort of current best practices in light medicine. Like it's a pretty new book. I think it's only maybe four or five years published. Mm -hmm. um, but, but before I read that, I read a book that was written a long time. Well, long time, you know, um, it's all rele like relevant to what's long and what's not long. You know, if we're talking evolution, like, you know, a million years isn't that long. But this book is from the, the 1960s and it was written by a guy called John Ott and it's called Health and Light. And he, he, that's a fascinating book. And there actually is a YouTube documentary on this book. Um, if you typed in John, John Ott on YouTube, you'd, you'd see basically what, like, it's just basically a video version of the, the, the findings in his book. But John Ott was a slow last time photographer. So, you know, when you see like those, like those films of like flowers opening really quick. Yeah. So like, yeah, he, but like he literally like, the thing about those movies is like, they're like months in making, like, you know what I mean? It's, they, just, they just leave a camera there for months on this plant. But then the, the film that, is the end product is like literally like 30 seconds <laughs> so it's really really time intensive work well from his study of plants with this slow lapse uh, time photography he noticed the effects that different lights were having on plants in terms of how they grew and you know they'd have mutations and some would grow some would grow all this and he would do all these experiments where he'd block like ultraviolet light and you know, because at the time like ultraviolet was like oh you got to get out of UV you know it's, oh, it's, that's the cancer and then he was like He's like, that's not what my plants are showing me. It's like sometimes he's like, you, they need a certain amount of it. Certain plants need a certain amount of it at certain times, you know. So, and then he'd block other way. So he he'd block like the ultraviolet. He'd block other wavelengths. He'd block all wavelengths. He'd do all these experiments, and he knows that just like how profound light, the impact of light was on the growth of these plants, which again makes sense when we know about like photosynthesis. But then like he was like, mm, I wonder what would happen if it did this with like rodents and mammals. And then eventually, you know, he's like, I wonder what happens with like humans in this and then so basically the the whole like takeaway of his book is like light affects everything plants mammals humans and he's just like and, and it, we need to get a greater understanding of the full spectrum of the electric connect spectrum so again i i used to be very sort of guilty thinking that light was just like the visible light spectrum but he's like no no light is all of it he's like it's the gamma waves and the, like the the electric waves that's going off our wi-fi now and like microwaves and all, that's light like a microwave is light it's just that it's in the non-visible spectrum same with like a gamma wave like a, so gamma and and um x-rays they're below ultraviolet at, at one side and at the other end of the visual spectrum so it, it goes non-visual visual and then non-visual again and so like ultraviolet they're they're like everything that's ultraviolet and below they're higher frequency uh higher frequency shorter wavelengths and then when you start red, when you start getting towards the red end of the visible spectrum, there are longer wavelengths, slower frequency. But then after you get into infrared, you have your microwaves and your your radio waves. So that's just all light. But his book just showed the profound influence of like blocking certain lights and, and stuff like that. So it's an area I need to know more about in terms of like what to dose. Your, your original question was what could you do better? It sounds like you're doing everything absolutely brilliant there. Robert C. Jake, Jacobs, who's on Instagram and who I've, I actually had in my podcast um he would have been profoundly influenced by by charles Polkman, but rob's also into like whole circadian biology stuff and he now would be a lot more up to date on like 
best practices with like sort of red light therapies and stuff like that. But it's it's only an area that I'm starting to explore more is more sort of the light aspect than, than so say I was I came into this more from the circadian biology standpoint. Mm. But the thing I like the, the whole thing I like with the circadian biology standpoint, going back into our earlier conversation on like knowing and doing, is that you can actually apply things so simply to your circadian rhythms. It's like well, because you know when, when you start telling people about artificial like, like so what like at like four p.m. in in like in like Ireland, I just don't do anything. Like it's like no, you can still look at your phone, but just buy these glasses, just get these blue light blockers, just get them, put them on your face, and that's it, done. And then it's just like that would be like level one. If you did that, you'd be you'd be doing yourself a good service. And then it's like, okay, what if you could step? If someone came back and said, "Oh, I'm not the difference. Kind of, is there anything better I could do?" I'd be like, "All right, let's talk about the light in your house. Let's talk about like not exposing your skin too much to artificial light because your light your skin picks it up too." Um, you know, then like you could talk about other things like sleep hygiene practices, like your temperature, body temperature. Like there's mm-hmm. whole other things we could get into. You know, dark mm-hmm. room, cool room, that we could optimize it. Um, but it sounds like you're doing a good job. Just one other thing that came to my mind, you're talking about your girlfriend and her exposure to light. There's a couple of things I wanted to talk to you or tell you here or speak about is that, isn't it funny that me and you, again, we come from the strength conditioning world, but like we know about the principles of stress and adaptation. You know, all, we also have Hans Selle and the general yeah, adaptation. I, 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 yeah, I was just thinking about that before. It's like, well, you, you're not going to throw a, a hundred kilo barbell on the back of someone who just spends their life on the couch. It's yeah. the same thing. It's the same thing. It's just a dose response, right? If somebody's Absolutely. been doing 60, 70, 80 kgs repetitively every day, every week, then a hundred is going to be just fine. But if you go from zero to a hundred or from the couch to a hundred, you're likely to get some issues, right? Absolutely. And it's the same with the sun. If you're yeah. someone who's chronically spending most of your time year round inside and then one day it's roasting outside and the sun is in its peak and you just go out and you go out for like four or five hours, that is the equivalent of what you just said. That's like taking a beginner into the gym and fucking smashing them into the ground and then they're in bits for days. And like it's, it's the exact same with the sun. It's a dose response. And it needs to be built up slowly. And the same thing has happened to people's eyesight too because mm. we're, we're always squinting our eyes because we're looking at fine things. We're looking at our screens. We're looking at small writing and we're not getting a chance to expand our eyes and look away out into the horizon. And I mean, th- uh, Mike Boyle said one thing one time and I don't agree with everything Mike says, but like he, you know, there's a lot of stuff. As, as it's also funny. I always laugh about Kieran when a flat. He's always like, you know, it comes back to Uncle Mike. But like, uh, Mike, Mike said this one thing one day. He goes, you know, usually he's like cliches are cliches for a, a reason. And it's like we know the one that if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's like it's not necessarily that you lose it, but your neurons become sort of detrained. And it's like if you're not getting a chance to expand your eyes or be out in full spectrum light, well, then your eyes are like, I don't, I don't use that. So like, I'm gonna conserve energy and like fuck being able to look into the distance and fuck being able to be adapted to full spectrum light i'm inside all the time so we're just deconditioned but that mm-hmm. mindset it isn't in the medical you know the medical industry like oh no you you gotta put slabber on the sunscreen and you gotta block you gotta block ultraviolet rays from hitting your retinas because like that shit causes cancer and it's like in the context of how you're in in the lens that you wear i can see why you think that but if we were to mm-hmm. step back even further and say right if we knew if we looked at that through a lens of general adaptation, hormetic effects, dose response, like it all makes sense of why people do need to wear sunscreen and why people do need sunglasses, but they shouldn't. Like they shouldn't, they shouldn't again, need them, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't need them. They shouldn't need Now, I just want to make one thing clear. Sunglasses are needed at certain times. Like, like if something is really shiny, so like ultraviolet rays can cause damage to your retina. Like they, mm. they can, they absolutely, that's why you don't look directly at the sun. And there are times where it's very, very bright or, or there are situations like uh, uh, the example I was give: if you're on a ski slope, right. like the, the, the light rays that come off the top of skis are very strong. And I'd be like, you, you got to protect your retinas. Cause again, it's going back to right. When we, when we talk about eyes, we're talking about the visual function of the eye, which is mm. where the medical profession really look at it. And then the non-visual, which is where the circadian biology people think about it. They, mm. They're more about light is information, regulating physiology. And that's where it is sort of like if you're block if you if you have to block your eyes with shades, that's where it can screw up your circadian rhythms. It be, it become a circadian disruptor, and circadian disruption from the current research literature out there is a major major health risk when it's when it's chronic, when your circadian rhythm is out of sync chronically over a long period of time. Like all the the literature really just point to that being a precursor to like serious health issues down the road. So that's why this need to block your eyes and then this is the second point by the way there is research now and i have a paper on this because i spoke with this with evan 
like for you to for you to actually make melanin in your skin so melanin is the pigment you need to make tan and that's very protective then against ultraviolet rays you need to get full spectrum light into your eye so mm-hmm. if you want to get a sunburn wear sunglasses chronically <laughs> because you you're not you're not getting the full eye spectrum in your eye that's needed for for melanin production to be signaled to be made into your into your into your skin and there's a paper on that that they've showed that, that, that essentially we need to get full spectrum light into our eye to make the melanin. Because you actually make melanin too in your choroid level of your eye too. Yeah. And then you need that then to get a signal to your body, start making melanin in your skin cells so it's, that you'll actually, it's actually, so you'll tan. Like. Yeah. And then, I mean, back to circle back to what you were saying before, everything is connected and we're just getting there one step at a time, a little bit late, but with our specialist lenses right no pun intended again yeah Uh, yeah. just going through life looking at one thing and then being like oh it connects over there and then oh it connects over here (laughs) and then we're we're, it's like we're dumbfounded and then yeah there's there's also our maybe our western mindset that also constricts us as to well we can make those relationships but that one you cannot make like don't don't go linking this to that other thing over there because that's not like how we think over here you know and that there's still some resistance to it as well, right? To, to talking about those things. Um, yeah, another thing that I that I learned through that that fantastic video I watched was uh, melatonin, which we know as being you know something you take to help you sleep. Um, that is produced by the, produced by the pineal gland at night. Yeah, it seems like that's a backup system for your mitochondria that actually produce uh, melatonin during the day, thanks to sunlight. So they produce that as, and, and I think it acts mainly as a major antioxidant to yep, kind of buffer, buffer reaction, reactive oxygen species. Um, and so if you think about this, then again, you don't get the sunlight, you don't get that positive effect from it. Um, and then, and then the, just the link between those two was super interesting because I, I, I never heard of it. I, I looked into, I looked into this whole like cytochrome C and, and infrared light yeah. years ago. I remember that. I, I remember pulling out a paper and they were talking about it but now it seems like it's common knowledge you know that your cells your mitochondria is directly affected by uh by light rays i guess yeah so in that book light therapies i'm reading too the the author speaks about the woman who discovered that her name's tina karu it's like t-i-i-n-a k-a-u-r i think that's how you spell her name tina karu she's estonian if i remember correctly mm. but she was the, she she's the person who termed apparently termed the coin photobiomodulation and she was the one that showed that infrared light acted on cytochrome c in the mitochondria so and it, it's amazing like just you know like you probably you know you've listened to my podcast and i always ask that question you know, if you could invite five people to dinner who would you invite dead or alive and i've always found that and it's probably just an unconscious condition on my part. I always name men. Like, I don't, I don't have any great women in it. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, when I read this woman, I was like, Tina Caro, and I, like, I read about all her work, and I was like, I was like, why don't, like, how have I never heard about this woman? Like, why don't we know about this woman? Like, like she's just discovered something that's, like, like unreal. You know what I mean? It's just like, and it's, it, it, listen, it's not the fact that she's a woman, it could be a man, but I'm just like, there's so many nameless scientists and people out there that we just don't know. And it's like, you know, it's like, yeah. you talk to anyone, it's like, you know, like, do you know the Kardashians? It's like, yeah, yeah, we know the Kardashians. It's like, I was like, you know, it's probably more important to know some like Tina Caro than the Kardashians. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's just a lot like of that, that, we, is, that we all know that we shouldn't necessarily, that we don't need to know. And <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the reverse is true as well, right? But it's it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. And um, that's why, as like at the top of this conversation, I just said, listen, I'm, I just love talking about life and human experience and just all this stuff is amazing. I mean, it's, uh, I think a part of it too is just trying to like we're never going to fully understand it because even right now it's funny I had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day it's like you know we talk about first principles you know so first principles is just stripping everything back first principles essentially is like just saying this why okay next why and it's like we get to the next answer and then why and like really if you strip it all back as far like you if you know more on this I'd love to know but as far as we can go is the big bang like we keep stripping everything back it's like okay and then why is it well it's the beginning of time and what was that well we don't really know we think it's just bang it's like well and then before that like because that's when like you know any really religious people are like yeah yeah scientists you still don't know and it's like well nearly you you're kind of making it up it's like we're all making it up then like we still don't know so it's kind of like 
I think one of the things in life is like we're just trying to get that little bit more understanding all the time. And it kind of gives us this, you know, it's probably our unconscious need to have more certainty all the time. Whereas like, you know, it's it's kind of like I always think about like Gautama the Buddha and he's just like, guys, guys, I told you this 2000 years ago or whenever it was. He's like, you just got to get comfortable being uncomfortable being uncomfortable you got to get comfortable with uncertainty it's just the only certainty is uncertainty and it's, it's just like yeah yeah we know but we still want to find out like about like you know these like you know these like biological mechanisms they have like what we're talking about like well we just want to specialize in these one areas because we think this might be the answer and he's just kind of like you know thousands of years ago for any of this technology like I'm telling you you just got it's telling you, we still won't know he's just like just get comfortable with that yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so it's, it's uh, almost back to that the full circle idea. Uh, remember an Alan Watts lecture where he was talking about you know this this monk that he went to visit and the monk was like cursing and he was smoking and it's like what what is going on? Like, <laughs> aren't you guys supposed to be perfect? And it's <laughs> and it's once you go all the way through and it, and it's like you know obviously we're not saying that those are things you should do or that are good for you, but. It's it's interesting how you know, like you said, if you if you strip things back far enough, then it's all back to this. But then if you push things forward far enough, then you're all you're you're back to square one. And yeah, then, yeah. Right? It's like if you could have the perfect life. Three weeks later, you're bored on the beach with your fucking margaritas, whatever the the cliche is. And then what do you want? You want uncertainty. You want a you want unknown, and you want challenge, and you want this, and you want and then you're yeah. Back you want to like... you want spontaneity. Yeah, you want you want like the word I use. <laughs> You want yeah, spontaneity, you're like oh, I want, I want adventure. I want to be spontaneous. And then that's just, you put that so well. It's like yeah. And then like the next three weeks, like oh, I want stability again. I want a home. I want certainty. I want to know. I want a rhythm. I want a routine. And then like when that happens, you're like fucking hate this. It's the same thing every day. It's Groundhog Day. I want an adventure. Yeah. Just well, it's, this loop. I, I guess I guess we 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 love to think, in obviously in in black and white terms and ends of the spectrum. Since yeah. we're talking about spectrums, and and then, but everything is a uh, is a to some extent uh, a play on the spectrum between. It's like, and then you go back, and it's like it's fucking all waves, man. <laughs> it's, it's like light. We're just undulating between parasympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic. The night, the day, the 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 rhythm, the disruption of the rhythm, which is in yeah. and of itself a rhythm on a, on a macro scale, and it's it's we're all back to that and and it's i guess the human condition that we we go back to again you know what it, it's uh it's so funny you mentioned rhythm there and undulations. So I, I love that idea of rhythms because i'm always and you mentioned anna watts who's honestly one of my heroes i absolutely love that bloke that's a bloke i would love to to meet mm, sometimes yeah. like so, sometimes when i lie down and go sleep i'm like tonight's tonight i'm gonna meet lincoln tonight's tonight i'm gonna meet watts i'm like <laughs> i'm just waiting for him to come into my dreams and have a conversation with him i just love to have a conversation with lincoln too and he just fascinates me uh, and, uh, you know, loads of, like again, love to meet Jesus, even if Jesus wasn't actually a real person, but just like the whole like entity or the concept of him. Really, like, and I also, you probably, I don't know if you've heard me say this joke, but I also have this joke that if, if I ever did meet him, I'd be like, I knew it, knew you weren't white, I knew those statues were bullshit, no way you could live in Jerusalem and be that white, knew it. <laughs> but, uh, oh, um, what was I gonna say just before that? I know I had Alan Watts there in my head, it'll come back to me in a second. Yeah, you had a chat with a friend of yours. No, there was something else I was about to say. It'll come back to me in a second. It's that I also feel like I have dementia now when I do that. It's it's the dehydration from. The, oh, sorry, I remember. Yeah, the uh, the when you were mentioning the undulations, the waves. Like I I, I love I love using that. I love like yin yang, black uh, black white, hot cold, day night. Like day nights, I was the other one. I was, it was like you wouldn't know what day was. It was no night. So you had the whole concept of like good evil and, and stuff like that. But when you mentioned undulations, funny. Just when I was studying that textbook with light. Like, like, it's funny. People always, I don't know if it's an assumption or, or like this perception. Like, I'm really smart. I'm like, I'm not. Like, my fundamental knowledge of certain things in science is like really bad. Like, literally, only last week I I found out that light is an electromagnetic wave. Like, I've I've heard it, but I never understood it until I saw the diagram. And it's like, yeah. oh, they're perpendicular to each other. You have this magnetic wave and an electric wave, and we're at ninety degree angles, and then the light goes in this direction. And then, like, just I was like, I was like, oh my god! Like, it's like everything's just a wave. Look at it; it's just undulating. It's like up and down again. It's just left and right, hot and cold, and yin and yang. And I was like, it's just contrast. We need contrast to be able to make sense of things. And I'm just like, oh, so now I get this electromagnetic wave. So when you just said like the undulating, it's like that image just came back to my head. It's like, it's just like, it's almost as if like the answers to certain things anymore don't surprise you anymore. It's like, yeah, 
I'm not because it's a principle, you know what I mean? This undulating yeah. and, and contrast. Like that, that was the one thing I re- the one thing I really learned from Watts that uh, one beautiful lesson was this idea of contrast. Mm, yeah, and, you know the, du- the duality of everything, oh, right? It's like the coin so and, good. and the the flip the flip side of the coin, and seeing everything in in those terms is so much more helpful. I find. Oh yeah. Always looking for yeah, but what's the what's the other what's the dark side of the the moon? You know what's the other it, side exactly. Of the so like this, like the like the, the lecture I love is where he's like, stop trying to make everything good because he's like, if everything was good, you wouldn't know it was good. Like so, he's like, evil and bad are so necessary in existence, and like so, the but but the thing is that, so uh, so this is my own thought is like, but we don't need like, it's it's almost as if like when people think of well, this is me when they think of contrast or dualism like what comes to my hand is or my mind is like this 50 50 split and it's like you don't need a 50 50 split it can be literally 99.9 percent versus just 0.1 so it's like we do want to get to a world where like really bad shit evil stuff is as minimized as possible but it still has to be there to give some type of contrast it's like mm. the black swan it's like we only need one black swan out of a thousand to know that one black swan exists that, that mm. so that we know that all swans aren't white it's the same it's not it's like so what i'm trying to say is we don't need like a 50 50 split between good and evil to know that both are in existence you know what i mean we just need but and but there has to be some existence of shittiness to know and what goodness is yeah and it, it's also going to vary over time and and then over yeah. you know eras and different states of civilization i i just finished watching i've been i've been reading graham hancock for uh probably 15 years now i think that's probably accurate um ever since he released fingerprints of the gods are you familiar with his work i i know his name and you know i'm so happy you said it because you mentioned him now and also the other person's work who I've really been meaning to read and study is Stephen Pinter because James Fitzgerald mentioned him the other day. I was like, me to get it because I've just seen Pinter mentioned by so many people that I respect. So mm-hmm. and Graham Hancock. Yeah, he's he's a, he's fascinating. He just released a, a Netflix series, a, do- a documentary on what he's been studying for the last twenty years, and you know going back to what might have happened to us at the at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, like twelve thousand six hundred years ago or whatever. And talking about, you know, things falling out of the sky and then finding all those common myths and all the religions and all the ancient stories. And it's 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 really fascinating to think about, you know, that ebb and flow is has always happened and on a on scales that we can't even imagine. Uh, but but then it, it we we come back to, you know, what we do every day as well and what what we're pursuing, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, it was interesting at the beginning when you said uh you know, talking about meaning and, and the, the only meaning is, is, the, is our search for, uh, for, for meaning and purpose. And um, what, what have you been, you know, reading into or looking at in those, in those realms of, of meaning? And then do you, how much, how much time do you take to reflect on those, on those core uh, principles versus, like you said, the acquisition of knowledge, the implementation of what we learn? How, do you find, do you find it, is it easy for you to detach yourself from that pursuit almost and and reflect a little bit? I would say I probably spent too much time thinking about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, like it's it's Can funny. You spend it, too much time thinking about that. Probably, well, I don't know. But I, honestly, I I, I I I don't have a very thought out answer to that yet. In terms of, can you think too much about it? I spend a lot of time just thinking about life and life and death do, like on a, what do you what do you do? do you do you sit there do you walk do you, do you do mostly you... walk and i think about a lot when i walk yeah I, yeah I i i do a lot of thinking when i walk um no no phones do you not take your phone do you do you, oh, no, it, do you not use it no What's no it, 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 i could be, i could be listening to stuff i, I vary so was, like i don't put any hard fast rules and i usually am always listening to something but i, I could zone out there are, there are times though where when i go for a walk and i just I just know that no, I, I don't need any more, more ingestion right now. I need to just be left alone, and I need just I just need my own thoughts right now. So, yeah, it, it varies. It depends, but I probably do my best sort of meditating. That's I I always use the word meditate instead of thinking. Not that I have anything against word thinking, but I do a lot of my best meditating as I move and as I walk. Um, I uh, I've never officially done like a meditative practice where I set down time in a room and think but i'm always thinking about that stuff sean probably no different to yourself like meaning and purpose and what am i doing myself and am i contributing and 
you know, what really is this all about? And Jesus Christ, I'm 35, five years ago, I was asking the same things 10 years ago, and I'll probably be asking the same things five years from now. And I think the, the more I got older and the more I've read in, in, in terms of like Buddhism type stuff, like, so this year, Sean, I've read a lot on human trauma. So some mm-hmm. really good books that I read were uh, The Trauma of Everyday Life by Mark Epstein, which I found was a phenomenal book. I really, really good. I read it twice. Um, and actually... That's another thing. I usually don't say I read. I usually say I study. So like I might read something, but reading when I say reading, I, I often think that as a more passive thing. Whereas I, like when I study, I'm like really like actively engaged in the material. Like I'm absorbing it and I'm trying to like really kind of put it into my own sort of thoughts and create some sort of thought process myself. But Epstein's book was phenomenal. So he uh, he's a Western Western trained um, psychiatrist and and but he's very well versed in Eastern Buddhism. So he mm-hmm. basically kind of he basically kind of gives you a snapshot of how he goes about his sort of whole treatment model and process of how he sort of integrates his Western training with sort of the, the Buddhism influence. And it was just very good. And he basically kind of described his take on the Buddha's life and, and what those learnings meant. And, you know, just some, some beautiful lines in it and some beautiful takeaways. So like, you know, to be human is to be traumatized, you know, and it's, it's as if like the Buddha was saying, listen, it's part and it's part and uh, it, it's just part of the deal. You want to be human. You want to be a soul and become a human body and come into this earth. Trauma is just part of the deal. We all and he's, and he's got such it's like the Buddha's like we we're all traumatized. To di- it's a spectrum again. We're traumatized to different degrees, and how we relate to our trauma is different. Like and there's a great story in the book too. Where he talks about this woman who I know we are going off here. So we're, you were asking me more about like sort of life and things you, like that. But go, anyway, you go, Robbie. Follow that. Follow that path, <laughs> my friend. Um, but it's a great story of a, of a of a woman whose whose baby dies. It's a fable, like about the Buddha. But it, her, her baby dies, and she's going around the village, and she's like, just basically, she's going crazy. And people are like that woman is a psychopath. Stay away from her. She's she's carrying this dead baby around with her. So one man finds pity on her, says, listen, I know a guy that can help. And it's the Buddha. And he brings her to the Buddha. And she was like, can you bring my baby back to life? Can you help me? Can you help me? And he was like, I can help. And she's like, I'll do anything. And then he goes, you have to do me one favor. And she's like, I'll do anything. He goes, I want you to go get mustard seeds. And she's like, okay, I'll get mustard seeds. And he goes, now you have to go, right, and get them from a house in the village. But when you go to the, every house, you have to ask everyone in the house, has anything bad ever happened? happened to anyone in that family any member of the family has there been any you know anything at all any traumas any deaths and if you find one family that have never had any issues you can get the mustard seeds and i'll help you so of course or she goes off to the village and she comes back to the boat and she says i couldn't find one one household that have not been afflicted with trauma or or some type of adversity and then he's basically goes i so the buddha's basically i i helped you you know, and then she got her, she, you know, she got her enlightenment. She was like, okay, my child died, but that, like she was, she was, he's basically trying to tell her that everyone has trauma. Like he, she, he's basically saying, you're not special. Okay, your child died, it's terrible. But he's like, everyone has trauma in their life. Everyone has had death, yeah. death in the family. And everything will pass, right? Time will, will, uh, time will yield all wounds. And that's yeah, something that I've been trying to, to think about. And I've, you know, knock on wood, uh, times have been pretty good recently, but uh, you never know what's around the corner. And just thinking about that is next time you're in a rough spot, like I've had some back, some back issues for the last while. It's, it's much better now. But mm. I, I remember those days where it was like, man, I'm not I, like, I can't do this. I can't fucking do this. Mm. And I, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't see myself just doing another day of that fucking shit. And, um, and just thinking now that trying to, you know, yeah, again, just realize that, hey, yeah, that's a shitty moment, but things will, get, things will get better. Pain, yeah. you know, reduces back to the mean, so we know it's going to get better eventually. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that was the great learning, too, from, from the book, you know, the, 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 the impermanence of everything, pain and pleasure. Yeah. And, you know, his life story is phenomenal, too, and that, like, he became a, what's called an aestheticist, and he did aestheticism, and that's basically where people, like, they just do like shitty ass things themselves they starve themselves they cut themselves they you know they they whip themselves because they think that that's the way to enlightenment and he realized that he got this image of when he was a kid underneath a, a tree and he was just happy and, and he realized i was just a kid and i was just happy just to be happy and he's like 
this is ridiculous then like why am i suffering to think that's his enlightenment he's like you can just be happy and then he realized that pain and pleasure are both impermanent so he's like why like trap yourself into either he's like why so he he basically was like you either you get people who punish themselves to think that that'll bring to enlightenment or you get people who avoid their trauma by material by getting material goods like you know little cars and houses and all this so so they, they they're trying to be old like they're trying to just be happy all the time but they're actually just avoiding their trauma and then the other people they they like self wallow in it and like they you know they're the people that like like they just like they like to suffer thing and that that will make them better people or you know those people they throw their suffering in your face they'll think that'll make them a better human and he's like the middle way was his way he's like no you just come back as a third person and reflect on your trauma and just let it go like just water he's like it's impermanent it'll go in time pain pleasure it's all impermanent so he's like just embrace it if it's shit good if it's great good it's kind of like uh, Jocko Willink he's like you know I think with Jocko good he's like you know this happened good that happened good it's like my favorite word good but it just it was it was just a very refreshing read so I read a lot as I said I read a lot in trauma that that was a great book um, and some other good books was uh, What Happened to You by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey phenomenal book on trauma again mm. and I just recently finished um, Van der Volk's Van, Van der Klook's book uh, Basil Van der Klook, The Body That Keeps the Score it's phenomenal uh, and those books yeah i think my wife has it on the shelf that's a great that's a great book read it read it twice listen to an audio and they i found that that book really complemented um polyvagal theory because uh, okay. what, what, what what and then two other books and uh, that i think are most reads are thinking fast and slow by conman but my favorite book at all, of all time with human behavior is behaved by sapolsky that book is just fucking i think that book like is a central reading for every single human like if i was to like take i know earlier on i was like if, if I could like take just the main tenets of that book and teach it like as curriculum to kids from like school and like this is why humans are the way they are you know what I mean just to really start to open people up to, into like understanding which can lead to into compassion and empathy and but it's, it's actually know. fascinating how oblivious we are to our own you know inner workings oh, and, and absolutely. like you said like how much better could the world be if every child knew a little bit more and every adult knew how those things work and be able to be a little bit less you know fucking in the driver's seat and at the wheel screaming versus no no i i can see from a little you know i can have the third person view from grand theft auto and i can have a look around and, and be a little bit more detached yeah. than, than than what i actually am but um i i need to go and i need to go and get behave i remember i i got zebras and ulcers way back uh probably listening to one of your podcasts and have you know a few of your guests mention it back back then i haven't read behave and the polyvagal theory is something i've been wanting to revisit recently have you reread it recently yeah or, yeah so that, it, that would you recommend going back through it because i read it like probably like I, eight eight years I, ago i i i absolutely to be honest it, it's funny the way my sort of education goes with some materials is that like so so epstein's book the 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 trauma of everyday life I picked that book up about two years ago and I mm. fucking could not get into it. Could, literally, I was like, I, I just I, I just can't read this. And then when I went, it, it was just like, this will sound airy fairy, but it's just like my soul just was like, I kind of want to read that book again. And I just like, when I, and I remember when I read it the first time, I was like, how did this not resonate with me the first time? It's just uh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't, in, I wasn't in the right place at the right time for that information to be absorbed. And so with Polyvagal, the first time I read Polyvagal, I was like, this is so boring. I just I just could not get in. And then I've read it like three times to that. And I was like, I love this book. This book is, I absolutely uh, love it. I just I love it. I need to pick it back up. I need to pick it back up. Uh, uh, but, but the, John, the essentials, the, the reason why, the reason why um, the body, if, if you read Body Keeps Scores and Polyvagal, there's there's such a tight link between those. Because right. what, what, what Polyvagal theory done for me and it's a bias in me because of where I've come from. I've always come from things from, from like mental health aspects from a very like physiologically driven aspect in that like I think like people who've got serious mental health issues, if they if we really like looked at like their circadian rhythms and their sleep and their hydration and their nutrition and their movement, as well as what happens to them during their development throughout childhood and you know everything that went on from an environment standpoint too so you know even when they were like just a baby in the womb and the epigenetic signals but also to the environment they grew up in as a kid that that all plays a role but the big thing with polyvagal was this whole concept of regulation 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 if you as a human being are not regulated internally like your homeostasis is off your but you can't regulate body temperature you can't regulate your digestion you can't you know, you, you just can't regulate 
hormonal signals and he's like you're if your physiology is way off your psychology is off and we know this inherently yeah. like i mean like 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 think about like hangovers why does a hangover happen because you cause something biochemically in your body and the next day you feel like shit but but but, but another thing too another thing too sean is this babies okay babies do not have a cortex to cause like the, like so when a baby is distressed it's not because it's like it, it's like oh i've got a, an exam next week or i have a mortgage or i had a fight with linda a baby is in stress because their internal regulations off they're they're cold or they're too warm or they soil themselves or they're hungry or they're sleepy so the thing with polyvagal is like if you are unregulated you cannot relate to someone and then you can't reason with someone so he's like if you're unregulated you are in fight or flight and you can't socially engage so polyvagal is this polyvagal is like these mm. three things the main things about it is like humans right there's three systems that we interact through the world with social engagement fight flight or freeze and he's like for me and you right now to to um to to converse to have a conversation and to connect we need to feel safe and that means we need to feel regulated and we get that through our own internal physiology. Mm. But then also I pick up on signals from your voice and from, from what I see your face doing. So that's why mother baby interactions go like the cooing and all that stuff. And that, and then when you start reading like body keep score, um, when you start reading um, what happened to you, or if you read like anything by Joseph Shilton Pierce, they talk with those early like interactions from mother and baby. Um, and in the, in the trauma of everyday life by Epstein, he talks about Winnicott. Winnicott was one of these like famous early psych. So, um, I don't I don't know if he was a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist because you know the way they're different, but he he dealt anyway in that realm. And he talked about the good enough mother and that the mother basically is the like it's the external regulation to the baby. It gives the baby that foundation. Mm -hmm. it, it it attunes to the baby and gives the, the baby responsiveness. And then eventually, as the baby gets older and its its own nervous system matures, the mother then slowly lets the baby start to self organize and regulate itself. But the regulation is so important. So we have those three, we have our social engagement system, fight, flight, or free. So the first thing is that to socially engage, we have to feel safe so that we're not in fight or flight. So internally, our physiology feels safe. We're regulated. We're more parasympathetic. I can see your face. I can see your facial expressions. I can hear the tone of your voice. And that all comes down to, that all comes into vagus nerve stuff as well, because the vagus nerve obviously has so much input to like the, the, the muscles of your face your, and your facial tone and what, and what creates like, the projection of voice and stuff like that. But if, if we don't feel safe, the first system we drop back to is fight or flight. And that's where we, 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 we cry and we cry out for attention. The baby cries and cries and cries. But if that fails, and this is where like that fucking stupid fucking recommendation of parenting like 50, 60, 70 years ago, no, no, you don't want to, you don't want to pick up a crying child. They need to toughen up. So if the child keeps crying and crying, and crying, fight or flight. And if that does not work as a secondary strategy, they go into freeze mode and they shut down. And then that can become the mechanism they use then through adulthood. There are people that, you know, shut down and they just go inward and they freeze. So they, they learn just to disengage, they disengage. And then from a evolutionary standpoint, what Porges talks about in polyvagal is like freeze is a reptilian response. It Fight is. or flight is a, is a mammal response. Social engagement is the highest type of engagement. That's what makes us humans. Like we are the most socially engaged of all the like <laughs> of all animals. If we try to be good humans and be nice to each other, then maybe we can we can achieve that. And yeah, and, 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 and sorry to just cut. Uh, sorry, I'm a devil for. I'll, I'll show up after this. And um, but like, we want to understand people like Putin. Like, Putin is a damaged human. You know what I mean? Hurt, and there is that saying: hurt people, hurt people. Like Putin is just damaged. He's damaged. Hitler was damaged. Stalin damaged. It doesn't. It does not make uh, what they're doing right. So, and then people always think like I'm an appeaser. Well, I, I've actually never heard this, but I think people might think that like I give people a free pass or I appease because I say things like I unconditionally love everyone or I try to unconditionally love everyone. But that doesn't mean I like everyone. Unconditional love just means I have an acceptance that everyone is the way they are for a reason because we're all shaped by so many factors, so many environmental factors. Everyone is the way they are for a reason. And that's why I love that book by Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey, because the name of the book is What Happened to You? Mm -hmm. So in the book, Perry says, don't say to someone what's wrong with you. So if you, if you see a behavior that you, 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 you say, I just don't understand that, you don't say to them what's wrong with you. You say, what happened to you? Like, what happened to Putin? 
Like what? Like what happened to that human? Like he was a baby. He was a baby one time with a blank slate, born yeah. into the world, and then and then a child, and then a grown human. And it's uh, one thing I got completely different, you know, perspective of the world. But I, it's funny because I feel like you know Gary Vaynerchuk and Jordan Peterson seemingly have nothing in common, but but then the way that they talk about life in general is actually very close together. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you know you see a, you see a negative comment online. It's like. You know how shitty must that person's day have been? Like, what what's going on in their life that they're lashing out like this for? You know, for no good reason, probably. Uh, like it's most mo- most of the time, and and they can like having that, like you said, that unconditional love, compassion comes to mind, right? Understanding that, hey, you know, we we all like you said, we all have damage, we all have trauma, and we we all come from somewhere, and we we all go through stuff, and we're we're gonna keep going through more. Um, and that's just part of the game and and we have to and we have to we have to deal with it Robbie um what I'm gonna do for next time is I'm gonna say, extend my podcasting window to have you on because let me let me get that out of my throat cough that up here we go that's better um Robbie next time we will extend the time I promise so that we can keep rambling because I like your rambling and and I enjoy it <laughs> myself a little bit as well um so I have to let you go, my friend, but no problem. Uh, first no problem. of all, I want to thank you for, you know, taking the time to come in on the show and, and having a chat. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. And for those who don't listen to it yet, they should. Uh, where can we find your podcast, uh, Robbie? Hey, you just find it on iTunes, any, any where you find podcasts and find it. The, the website is um, all things. Well, sorry, the, the, the name is all things strength and wellness, but if you just type that in, you, you'll find it. But uh, yeah, if you liked anything you heard here today you'll probably hear more even though now I, I try and let the guest speak more than me i'm trying to get better at that i see i was the guest today so i got a chance to ramble so. exactly and you did a great job of it my friend uh thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for your time and uh yeah i look forward to the next one let's do it again thanks sean thanks for listening to this episode if you would like to support the podcast please take a few moments to leave a written review and a five-star rating on apple podcast if you want to watch this episode again you can find the full video recording on my youtube channel you'll also find hundreds of hours of free content all my podcasts my thoughts of the day structured presentations and more so don't wait go subscribe and i'll see you in the next episode take care